Now that we have understood what goes into the technical aspects of a battery, let's take a break for it and move into its historical background. The first historical evidence in the field of electrochemistry and batteries was dug out of a place in Baghdad, now Iraq, which archaeologically dates back to a period between 100 BC to 150 AD during the Parthian period, thus the name Parthian or the Baghdad battery. What it was, was actually a ceramic pot with an iron rod and a copper cylinder with vinegar as its electrolyte. Though this iron copper setup could generate about 1.1 to 2 volts easily, it was never used for this purpose. To be honest, the purpose of such a pot still remains unknown. Though it has been hypothesized, hypothesized that they were used for electroplating silver or preserving secret scroll, scrolls. But the modern era didn't actually look into the development of batteries until the end of 18th century. Then came in Logi Galvani, who showed that when we connect a metal to the nerves of an animal, the muscles move wrongly, calling it animal electricity. It was after Alessandro Volta's series of experiments which led to the conclusion that it wasn't the animal but rather, rather the metal which caused the movement and led to the development of the voltaic pile in 1800s, the first so-called battery. This voltaic pile consisted of zinc and silver plates which were stacked up and separated from each other by layers of cloth or paper which was soaked in a solution of salt or caustic soda. Faraday, the father of electrochemistry, worked on this voltaic pile to derive the quantitative laws of electrochemistry and this also paved the way for galvanic or primary cells. Here, we see an excerpt of Volta's paper on wet, wet pile. The first image shows the carrier of charge through different electrolyte solutions. The subsequent images showcase the voltaic pile and stacking them in series to generate a higher output voltage. After him came William Prashant with his stuffed battery. What he basically did was make the battery horizontal and replace the metal plate with plate of zinc and copper. This solid structure was the first battery which was set for commercial production. On the shoulders of Faraday's theoretical contribution, J. F. Daniel developed his Daniel's set which was able to produce a co continuous sustained supply of current far more efficiently. He used components similar to the truck battery for its electrodes, but used sulfuric acid instead as the electrolyte for the cell. Then came in Robert Groove, who introduced a two-fluid cell and also the involvement of a separator in the battery. The use of nitric acid here was very innovative since it decomposed the acid or the electrolyte instead of deterioration of the electrode. After him came Willem Bunsen, who replaced the expensive platinum electrode with a cheap and easily available carbon electrode in Glow's cell and helped its wide widespread acceptance. Even though it had widespread acceptance, it couldn't compete with Daniel's cell because the deterioration of the acid also led to development of hazardous and toxic NOx gases. Then came in Gaston Plant, who, with his lead acid battery, paved the way for rechargeable batteries. In the initial decades, it had its problems regarding its magnanimous size, which inhibited its widespread acceptance. But it strikes me as amazing that a battery which was discovered about 150 years ago is still having a widespread ac acceptance in daily life. Then came George Leclanche's zinc manganese dioxide wet cell, which led to the development of the modern primary battery. Its electrolyte consisted of a solution of ammonium chloride, which was later immobilized by the use of an ammonium chloride paste by Carl Gassner. And this gave birth to the dry cell industry, which continues to flourish today. The invention of alkaline electrolyte batteries, specifically storage batteries of nickel cadmium and nickel iron type, between 1895 and 1905, provided systems that could furnish much improved cycle life for commercial applications. The 1930s and 40s also saw further development in nickel cadmium batteries and also zinc silver oxide and zinc mercury oxide alkaline batteries which could provide the highest energy per unit volume and weight yet known. Since the mid 20th century, advancements in constru construction technology and availability of new materials gave rise to smaller and yet powerful batteries. Some of these were the development of lithium ion batteries during the 80s and its commercial development by Sony in the 90s and also the development of nickel hy hydrogen and nickel metal hydride cells which were more environmentally friendly 
and used for various applications. Now that we have got a completely good understanding of how the batteries came about, let's look into the batteries which are dominating the market today and the market industry of batteries. Talking about battery industry, it has two major industries. First is the primary battery and second is the secondary battery. Talking about the primary batteries market, the dry cell battery still drives the whole global industry, expected to grow at a rate of 4.4%, which is relatively lower with respect to secondary batteries. This industry is majorly split into alkaline batteries, lithium batteries, and other batteries like carbon battery, and is ruled by companies like Duracell, Toshiba, Excel, Panasonic, and FDK. As you can see, most of these companies are Asian. The alkaline industry itself is worth at about $17 billion and is ex expected to grow to $25 billion by 2023. A major part of this industry is consumed by the toys market. And as a matter of fact, China's market regarding toys is itself growing at 7.1% annual growth rate. Asian countries still produce a majority of primary batteries while USA and Europe produce batteries for specialty purposes. In the subsequent charts, you can see how battery consumption has grown, its division into various sectors and the countries producing it. China has been a leading consumer in the battery market, owing to all the industries setting up their factories in China. While India remains a major consumer in the primary battery market, majorly due to its defense sector and funding. As you can see in this chart, it appropriately reaffirms the point we were trying to make earlier. Asia, that Asia being the largest market, while South America being the fastest growing market due to the economic and social development in these countries over the past few years. Talking about technical specs of primary batteries, alkaline batteries and lithium metal batteries were both invented by Lewis Fury while working for Everend. Alkaline batteries can give energy for about two to four months and are favor favored over zinc other batteries thus for a longer supply span. These batteries have zinc and magnesium as the electrodes while sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide is the electrolyte. They, they showcase better energy density and leakage resistance with respect to other primary batteries and are environmentally, fe environmentally feasible as they are disposable and have no mercury. About, it, about its market, we have already talked about it but you can look it up here again. The graph goes on to show that primary batteries usually have a higher energy density. Moving on to lithium batteries, actually lithium metal batteries. These have lithium metal oxides as their cathode while a graphite rod forms the anode. Both of these cells, alkaline and lithium metal, showcase different charging and discharging graphs, which can be seen here in the graphs. The table also gives a clear technical comparative understanding regarding various primary batteries involving lithium. You can pause the video here for a better look at it. Talking about secondary batteries, the major segments driving this industry are the lithium ion batteries and starter batteries, that is, lead acid batteries. It was worth about $60 billion in 2019 and is expected to grow to about $92 billion by 2023, with a compound annual growth rate touching 13%. Some big companies in this industry include BYD batteries, Duracell, Cattle, and Tesla. The lithium ion battery and lead acid batteries are valued at $40 billion each at 2019 and are expected to reach about 130 billion and 60 billion respectively by 2027. Lead battery finds use in automotive industries as starter batteries for engines, while lithium ions finds use in consumer electronics and stationary battery packs. Talking about potential market, automotive battery segment with its advent of electric vehicles and a huge and being a huge consumer of lithium ion batteries is expected to be the fastest growing segment of the battery market. The graph shows usage of batteries in various segments and also, dis also the distribution of secondary batteries amongst its various types. Many countries in Asia and Africa don't have a good enough supply of electricity and with many policies regarding renewable energy technologies, batteries serve as a landmark. North America and Asia Pacific are primed to be the hotspot for secondary battery industry due to countries such as India, China and US working extensively in the electrical vehicle industry. The chart appropriately goes on to show the fact that Asia Pacific is the longest as well as the fastest growing market in the secondary battery segment and with increased use of consumer electronics, renewable energy plants and electric vehicles it is primed to be a hotspot for coming years. China already has showcased this growth and development 
in the electric vehicles industry and is planning to ease restrictions on automakers importing cars into the country. Lead acid batteries power much of our larger energy storage needs like in automotives and in batteries for renewables. The battery has lead peroxide as its cathode while sponge lead acts as the anode. Both dip in dilute sulfuric acid with water is to acid ratio being 3 is to 1. Its depth of discharge is 50%. That is, it only outputs half the charge that is input to it. You can look into the limitations and advantage here on the screen. But I want to talk to you about different lead acid batteries, namely sealed lead acid batteries or VRLA batteries and flooded lead batteries. The difference in both of these batteries is that with the help of absorbed glass mat separators or gelled electrolytes, the electrolyte is immobilized or made stationary in VRLA batteries while it is flowing and liquid in the other case, that is, Flooded lead batteries. Coming to lithium ion batteries, the cathode is made up of, of lithium cobalt oxide, while a graphite rod forms the anode. These batteries have, an energy, have a high energy density of about 100 to 265 watt hour per gauge or 250 to 670 watt hour per liter and have a depth of discharge of about 80%, thus owing them the name of deep cycle batteries. They have their own set of disadvantages, but I will leave it upon you to read them by pausing the video. I have gotten for you a video which will well showcase the working of lithium ion batteries and the advancements made in it. Today, there are different kinds of batteries based on the application for which they will be used. These visuals show the popular applications for each kind of battery technology. And it is clear from this chart that lithium ion batteries, invented back in the year 1991, are the most popular with over 35% share of energy storage. In this video, we are going to see why lithium ion batteries will continue their domination and in the future may even overshadow gasoline powered technologies by understanding the technology enhancements happening in this area. Let's take a lithium ion cell used in a DSLR camera and explore its internal parts. You can see that electrons will flow between the sheets when we connect the load across the battery. This natural electron flow means that the electrons were stored in an unstable condition before the load was connected. We need to better understand this basic principle to understand the technological advancements happening in lithium ion batteries. Here, the unstable electrons are stored in a kind of container called graphite with a higher electrochemical potential. And before storing, the electrons should be separated from the atomic structure of an element. There is a metal called lithium, which has a high tendency to lose electrons from its outer shell, and due to this, lithium is very reactive in nature. However, as part of a metal oxide, lithium atoms are very stable. Let's use an external power source. The positive side of the power source attracts the electrons. We use an electrolyte too, which blocks any electron flow through it. So instead, they flow through the external circuit and get trapped between the graphite layers. Similarly, the negative side of the power source attracts the lithium ions, and they also get trapped in the graphite layers. Eventually, the lithium ions are stored with a higher electrochemical potential. As soon as we remove the power source and connect it to a load, all the electrons in the graphite will flow through the load, and hence we can get electricity from this. There are three good characteristics for an energy source. Low cost, high energy density, and longer life. Let's explore how the lithium ion cell fares in these three aspects, and what are the future trends. Let's first consider the cost factor of lithium ion batteries. The capital cost required to set up a lithium ion based technology is way higher than its counterparts. However, when we compare the running cost of electric cars to gasoline cars, electric cars run at one-third of the price of gasoline cars. The main reason for the high capital cost is the presence of nickel and cobalt in the metal oxide compound. Moreover, battery makers use these two metals in greater quantities than lithium. Due to this reason, the cost of a lithium-ion battery is almost six times that of a lead-acid one, and three times that of a nickel-metal hydride battery. However, the good news is that the cost per kilowatt hour of a lithium-ion battery technology has been dropping at a rapid rate over the last few years so that in the future, it might overcome the capital cost hurdle. Lithium ion batteries provide much higher energy density than any other battery technologies, but are greatly inferior to gasoline's energy density. The most crucial part which affects the energy density is the storage medium of lithium ions and electrons. In a Tesla cell, the storage medium is graphite. Scientists are now trying a breakthrough technology by replacing the storage medium graphite with silicon. With this technique, it is possible to multiply the energy density by almost 4.4 times. However, silicon causes an unacceptable level of volume expansion and compression during each cycle. To take advantage of the high energy density of silicon, but to avoid its negative effects, some manufacturers have started using 5% silicon mixed in with the graphite. Now let's get it to the most crucial part, the life of lithium-ion batteries. The lithium-ion batteries of your old laptops used to die in one year. However, now they are easily giving three to four years of life. How do lithium-ion batteries die? To understand how researchers have been able to improve the longevity of lithium-ion batteries and why they are continuing this improvement, we need to understand the mechanism behind the death of a lithium-ion battery. Generally, a lithium-ion battery fails after a few years, even if you don't use it. This capacity loss is not abrupt. In fact, the process is electroless, which means it does not require any electricity flow. 
As per the operation discussed earlier, when the lithium ions are flowing through the electrolyte, they are covered with a coating called a solvent molecule. During the very first charge, the lithium ions, along with the solvent molecules, react with the graphite and form an SEI layer. The SEI layer is a blessing in disguise because it allows the lithium ions to pass through it. The SEI layer helps to avoid direct contact between the electrons and the electrolyte, thus saving the electrolyte from degradation. Assume, after the lithium ion cell is charged for some time, we remove the power supply. Now, the lithium ion cell is an open circuit. Even though the SEI layer tries to prevent the electrons from entering it, a small amount of electrons in the graphite can still tunnel through it. Due to some porous portions of the SEI layer, the solvent molecules present in the electrolyte can easily enter into it. The solvent molecule reacts and forms an SEI layer again. Here we can observe that the SEI layer becomes thicker than before, and simultaneously, the electrolyte is consumed. It is interesting to note that the degradation process of your lithium-ion battery is a very slow process when there is an open circuit. This process of lithium-ion cell death that we discussed above will be accelerated many times during an actual operation. Let's see how. This is because the movements of the lithium ions bring more solvent molecules, thus the thickening of the SEI layer is accelerated. This process consumes active lithium ions and electrolyte, and that's why the life of the battery is significantly shortened, depending on the number of cycles. From this discussion, it can be seen that the SEI plays a dual role in the battery performance. On the one hand, it protects the electrolyte from degradation and will support the main working of the battery, while on the other hand, it consumes cyclable lithium ions and electrolyte inside the cell, which leads to the death of the battery. However, the longevity of battery can be scalable up to a certain limit with the help of an electrolyte additive. This is like a secret sauce in a recipe that slows down the degradation process and helps to improve the battery life. Currently, Tesla batteries last for around 3,000 cycles, or around 7 years. And researchers are putting their best efforts into extending this to 10,000 cycles, which is equivalent to 25 years of battery life. Today, almost all valuable electronic gadgets are using lithium-ion batteries. But it is interesting to note that there are slight changes in the chemical composition of the metal oxides used. This is because factors like cost, life cycles, and energy density vary depending upon the type of application. The discussions so far have clearly explained how lithium-ion batteries are getting better in terms of energy density and longevity. A recent innovation in lithium-ion battery technology has given a big boost to the safety of lithium-ion batteries. This technology uses an aqueous electrolyte with halogen intercalation. In this technique, the addition of the helper halogen to the metal oxide side increases the mobility of the lithium ions. As the electrolyte is a salt and water type, it can resolve the issues of flammability, and it also increases the mobility of the lithium ions. The automobile industry will decide the future of lithium ion batteries. To achieve greater adoption in the automobile industry, lithium ion batteries need to be more competitive in terms of cost, life, and energy. A new technology called a lithium air battery has shown an energy density equivalent to gasoline under laboratory conditions. With its continuing improvements in all of the three aspects, the lithium-ion battery can definitely become the future power source of the automobile industry. We hope this video has given you a clear understanding about the future of lithium-ion batteries. Thank you. This chart shows the various technical parameters regarding lead-acid batteries and lithium-ion batteries and the, a comparative study between them. So you can pause this video here to get a greater, better look into it.